The panel members are Judd Arnett, a columnist for the Detroit Free Press from Detroit. Stanley Krajewski, editor of the Polish Daily News from Detroit. Claude Monroe, director of the eCourse Community Center from eCourse. Mrs. Janet Claver, housewife and former school teacher from Ann Arbor. Richard Vidmer, graduate student and former quarterback at the University of Michigan from Ann Arbor. Richard Ferrara, MD, a dermatologist from Gross Point Park. Edith Blinn Hall, public relations counsel from Detroit. That's our panel for tonight. And now here is your moderator, Bud Wilkinson. And now it's my pleasure to introduce a man that I have known, respected, and admired for many years, Richard Nixon. Good evening, sir. Here we are again. Yes, sir. Let's get him I'm tied up in the telephone. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bud Wilkinson, and I think that all of our television audience, in view of the uh, sports consciousness of this uh, great city at the present time, will be interested a little about you. Of course, everybody that hears Bud Wilkinson do the commentating on ABC Sports uh, has uh, heard of him and remembers his great Oklahoma teams, but I'm glad that he's on my team and I'm on his team now. Bud Wilkinson, Ark. <laughs> and <clears throat> incidentally, it looks like we're in a winter city. I was thinking with uh, the Tigers in the World Se Series and the Lions doing so well, I just a little, hope a little that winter business rubs off on me while I'm in Detroit. <laughs> And then, too, we have some other celebrities in the audience that I would like to introduce before we go to our panel. Uh, we have the governor of Michigan, Governor George Romney. <laughs> and then we have two of, I think, the greatest campaigners in the country, uh, Mrs. George Romney and Mrs. Richard Nixon, sitting on either side. <laughs> The other day when I was in Salt Lake City, I mentioned the fact that uh, General Eisenhower once said when he was talking about politicians and the fact that they were so different, there was only one thing that he thought most successful politicians had in common, and that was the ability to marry above themselves. <laughs> and I pointed out that both Governor Romney and I did that, of course. <laughs> and then uh, my two daughters, uh, Trisha and Julie. They have just arrived here from a campaign appearance in Buffalo. Uh, they're getting their share too, their baptism and fire to an extent. They had a little heckling, but they learned to handle it. After all, anybody that lives in our family learns how to be heckled. <laughs> <laughs> and now we want to go directly to the questions because I know that we have a panel here that will have a number of questions and we have a full hour for those questions. Judd Arnett. Uh, Mr. Nixon. Free press. You've been saying in this campaign that under your government, you wouldn't pour billions of dollars into programs that aren't working. I wonder if you'd be more specific and uh, tell us which programs you'd repeal. Well, when I was speaking particularly of programs in that field, I was referring to those that dealt with the problems of poverty in the cities. Uh, I'm referring, for example, to uh, many of the poverty programs, particularly the Job Corps program. Uh, I'm referring to some of the approaches to public housing uh, and I'm referring to some of the programs in the field of welfare. Now, when you talk about a repealing, I'm not referring to a meat axe approach in which we just go down and cut out all of those programs. But what I am suggesting is this. I think that in the field of training for jobs, for example, uh, we look at the Job Corps. We poured billions of dollars into that. It was a very well-intentioned program. But what happened? Two out of 10 of those, only two out of 10 who, of those who received Job Corps training uh, got jobs to which they attributed the Job Corps training for, and it cost us $11,000 to train each one of them. I think the better approach is to give a tax credit to private enterprise to train the unemployed for the jobs, for real jobs, so that they will get the jobs. I would substitute that for a substantial part of the Job Corps uh, program. Let's take the field of housing. Substituting for massive federal housing, federal <coughs> housing in which we, in effect, take those who are tenants of federal housing, and they become a colony apart. 
a people apart from the rest. Uh, I like the approaches that a number of Democrats, as well as Republicans, uh, people like uh, Chuck Percy, Senator Javits, and the late Robert Kennedy have suggested, and I, of course, have recommended them too in my speeches, Bridges to Human Dignity, in which we would provide, again, the tax credit to private enterprise to not only build private housing, individual housing that could be owned uh, by individuals who obtained it, but also the opportunity for people who live in high rises uh, to own their houses, because with that ownership will come the pride and the dignity that you're not going to get from living in public housing and feeling to be a class apart. It's this kind of approach that I'm speaking about. What I'm really saying is this. I think that over the past four years, we have seen billions of dollars poured into programs for a federal approach to the solution of our problems. What we're going to do is to have federal housing and federal jobs and federal welfare. What we need now is to move away from that approach, uh, have the federal government act where private enterprise can, but to enlist private enterprise and volunteer enterprise in building the housing, uh, providing the job training, and also providing the opportunity for individuals to move up, to become owners and managers and not just workers. That's the kind of approach I would have as distinguished from the present program. <laughs> Mr. Monroe. Uh, Mr. Nixon, you spent eight years in Washington as Vice President of the United States, right? And then you lost in an election as President of the United States lost in an election in California, and today the Republican Party and your campaign managers is telling us about a new Nixon. What's the difference between the new Nixon and the old Nixon? <laughs> well, Mr. McGraw, the new, Nixon, the, the new Nixon is a little older. <laughs> he doesn't have quite as much hair, as my wife points out from time to time up here. Uh, but on the other hand, I think perhaps uh, the best answer to that question is that uh, when an individual in politics or in education or in the business of writing for newspapers, uh, when he ceases to grow, when he ceases to change to meet the changing conditions, uh, then you can be sure uh, that he no longer is going to be living with the generation of which he is a part. Uh, I would have to say at this point, and I'm very proud of this, that over the past eight years, I've had a chance to travel through the world. I've had a chance to study the problems of the world, not as a participant, but one who was sitting on the outside looking at them. I believe I found some solutions to those problems. They're new solutions for the new world. They aren't the old solutions of 30 years ago, uh, most of which Mr. Humphrey now is advocating, but they are new approaches to those problems that I think we need, just as I answered in the question to Mr. Ar Arnett. And I believe that I can bring these new approaches that I would not have had eight years ago that I can bring them to the solution of our problems. Solutions to the problems of our cities. Solutions also to the problems in the field of foreign affairs. Solutions in the problems, the very difficult problem of restoring respect for law, respect for order, and having that with justice and progress. Uh, that is what I would say is the new Nixon as I understand it. <laughs> Mr. Vidmer. Mr. Nixon, because of the recent widespread demonstrations and disruptions on American campuses, there seems to be quite a bit of public pressure now on campus administrators to get tough and to crack down on the student rebels. What is your view in general on the role of dissent in society, and in particular, the role of dissent on the college campus? I'm for it. I'm for dissent because as I look back over the 190-year history of this country, as I'm sure you have as a student, Ann Arbor, uh, I find that dissent is the great instrument of change. It's the instrument of progress. And that's what really distinguishes a free society from the totalitarian societies. Uh, we change those things by reason of the dissent that are wrong. Uh, we aren't frozen into them. Uh, on the other hand, when we look at dissent, we have to recognize that it can also be an instrument of destruction if it does not follow a certain rule uh, that we should all understand, provided we look at our American political system. Now, uh, I've talked on a number of university campuses, and I've had some university and college students say, when I uh, point up that I think that there should be peaceful uh, dissent and uh, not breaking the law, they said, well, don't you believe in the American Revolution? And I said, I certainly do. But I point out that those who participated in the American Revolution had no peaceful way to redress their grievances. They had to have a revolution in order to do it. And then our founding fathers had the genius to set up a system of government 
which provides a method for peaceful change. Only once in the history of our country, 100 years ago in the Civil War, did that not work. And then we had to resort to war warfare in order to resolve the differences. But when you have a system that provides a peaceful method in which to change what we don't like, I don't believe there's any cause that justifies breaking the law or engaging in violence. And I think we should get that across to all Americans. I believe it's essential to get that across, particularly in the college campuses, because those who come from the colleges and the universities are going to be the thought leaders in the future. Uh, they have to go back to their communities, and they have to make clear that uh, while we, we believe in vigorous dissent, uh, that on the other hand, that when we engage in violence, when we break the law, uh, we destroy, in effect, the very system that we're attempting to build. Uh, and I think as we look at our college universities and campuses today, the great majority of students would support the proposition that I've just set forth. And I would say further, I noticed just yesterday in the paper, today in the paper, of a rather violent demonstration in Seattle, Washington, uh, conducted by some of the students, I understand, from the universities in that area against Hubert Humphrey. Uh, I think that was an appalling situation. Uh, some of those students demonstrated against me, too. Uh, that's something different. I will have to take it. But for the Vice President of the United States to be submitted to that kind of what was really not dis dissent, but an attempt to shout down the meeting, I say that is the difference. Let me put it this way. If anybody in an audience wants to get up and raise a question, if he wants to heckle in the great American or British tradition, that's one thing. But when he shouts and shouts and shouts and tries to deny to the majority the right to listen, then I think you ought to stop it and stop it as effectively and fairly as you can. That's what I think. Mr. Nixon, maybe I was invited here because I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> and I'm not a retiree, but I work with retired people. And immediately I got in touch with as many as I could in such a short time. You'd be surprised at the letters that did come in asking a few questions. I'm not going to read all these letters, but I would like to read one. Mr. Nixon, this is addressed to you. Last week, Vice President Humphrey announced that if he were elected president, he would increase Social Security benefits by 50% across the board. A suggestion for this these increased benefits may be considered by you. And it might be, if this is as she wrote it, of course, a larger increase for the lower and needy bracket and a reasonable increase for the balance. The amount of increase, of course, to be determined by the economic conditions and a smaller increase for both could be a lesser drain upon the economy. What do you think, she asked? Well, let me say what I think about Social Security generally and what I think about this proposition and what I think we can do and ought to do. First, uh, I could raise that. I could say, let's, let's raise Social Security benefits 100%. Then it would cost $30 billion rather than $15 billion. And neither is possible at this point. What is possible, of course, is this. One, we've got to stop the rise in the cost of living for the 20 million people over 65. There are 20 million in this country over 65. Most of them live on pensions, life insurance, or Social Security. They have seen, let's suppose that somebody four years ago had $10,000 in Social Security, life insurance, or pensions, a total capital of that. That's cut to $9,000 as a result of the increase, the inflation we've had in this country. Now, I think, I think we ought to have a new fiscal policy in Washington, D.C., in which we, uh, we stop the rise in the cost of living so that when an individual earns a dollar, and puts it into Social Security or into life insurance or in pensions, that then he gets a dollar's worth when he retires five or 10 or 15 years from now. And that would be, it seems to me, the most effective thing that we could do uh, for those living on Social Security right now. Stop the rise in the cost of their living and stop the reduction of the capital that they have in their pensions. And then second, I think that we ought to provide as the Republican platform uh, advocates, and this was as a result of, of mine and others who recommended it, we ought to provide for an automatic increase in Social Security benefits whenever the cost of living goes up. We should do that. And then third, as and when the economy of this country it gets to the place that we can afford to do more without destroying the value of our dollars, then of course we should increase Social Security benefits. Let's understand one thing once and for all. This is a rich country, 
And this country should be generous with the aged, it should be generous with the needy, it should be generous with everybody who cannot care for themselves. But we also want to remember this. Generosity, when it goes to the point of destroying the value of our dollars, when it raises the prices of the things that we buy, raises our grocery bill, raises our clothing bill, that isn't real generosity. That's robbing the poor. It's robbing the aged. And I think we ought to stop that kind of robbery and reestablish the value of our dollars across this country. Dr. Ferreira. Uh, Mr. Nixon, many of my colleagues in the medical profession are greatly concerned about Medicare and what it is doing to the medical profession. They are concerned especially uh, on the potential harmful effect it may have on the quality of medical care to the individual patient. Now my question is, what specifically is your stand on Medicare and do you intend to curtail it or increase it? Let me be very specific on even a broader subject of interest to your colleagues and also to all the people who might be the subjects of Medicare or other kind of medical assistance. Uh, first, uh, I support the Medicaid program. I did, of course, when we were in the Eisenhower administration. And I support the Medicare program. Uh, however, I disagree with uh, Vice President Humphrey on a key issue. He has advocated, as you know, extending this whole principle of compulsory health insurance to everybody. I'm against that. And the reason I'm against compulsory health insurance for all people is that I don't want ha to have happen to the quality of medical care in the United States what has happened to it in Britain. I made a study the other day of what had happened in Britain. One third of all the medical school graduates in Britain last year left Great Britain to go practice someplace else because the quality of care had gone down and because of the red tape of their compulsory so-called free medical program. I want to see that every individual who needs medical care is able to get it, but I want it to be good medical care, and that's why I want to keep the doctors free from, med from government control as much as we can. I, that is why I, I oppose the extension to compulsory health insurance on that basis. For the older, for the elderly people, Medicare, I think that is certainly an appropriate, and I, it is a kind of a program that I support. But there's one other point I should make. When we talk about how we're going to extend medical benefits in this country, we have to recognize that before we do any further extending, that we've got to get at the other end of the funnel. Because at the present time, I just looked at some figures. There's a shortage of 50,000 doctors in this country. There's a shortage of 75,000 nurses. There's a shortage of 600,000 hospital employees. And the reason for that, and this is another figure that was rather astonishing to me, in the last 10 years, the number of hospital visits uh, has gone from 15 million to 150 million. In other words, a tenfold increase. So what we need to do, and then my administration will move frontally on this, we need a massive program to develop more doctors, more nurses, more uh, hospital personnel, so that we can provide adequate care for the friends of Mrs. Hall and others who are on Medicare. I don't want to have our older people simply have that slip of paper that gives them the right to go to a doctor and then have them give bad medical care. Let's have them good medical care, and that's the kind of a program I'd be for. Mrs. Clavin. Uh, Mr. Nixon, I sure you know that lots of people are concerned that we're moving toward another era of repression of ideas kind of another search for the internal enemy. And I wonder what, as president, what steps you could or would take to spare us another time of accusations, irresponsible accusations, the hysteria and fear of the old Joe McCarthy time. Well, Ms. Flavor, I would, uh, in the first instance, you can only judge a man by his record. And uh, I would point out with some pride that uh, during the years I served on the House on American Activities Committee, I conducted a major investigation, the Hiss case. It's forgotten now, it was 20 years ago. Uh, but that case, I think, by most objective observers, was uh, rated as one in which it was a fair, objective investigation. Uh, in my view, uh, it is the responsibility of the President of the United States to see as I pointed out in answer to Mr. Vidmer's question a little earlier, to see that this great engine of dissent is not suppressed, 
suppressed by either choking it off or by the blanket of consensus, uh, because that's, what, that's the only way that we're going to get the spark of creative activity that we want. And as I pointed out in a major speech on the presidency a few days ago, I indicated that I thought that the, the, the White House itself uh, should welcome, should go out and try to get uh, differing points of views expressed from our young people, from people in all walks of life, so that we could get uh, perhaps a, a better uh, mix of ideas and finally more superior ideas by having them compete with each other. Uh, the only line that I would draw in terms of dissent is with regard to the basic question as to whether the individual involved is engaged in activities that are illegal or activities that are aiding an enemy of the United States in the very specific sense. And by that, I do not mean uh, a loose charge that this individual or that individual believes in Marxism or believes in communism and so forth. Let me be quite precise. Uh, it doesn't concern me a bit uh, that a teacher, for example, uh, wants to talk about Marxism or communism. We need to know more about Marxism and communism and socialism and all that sort of thing. Uh, I think where you draw the line is where the individual in effect says, I'm not just going to teach the students about that, but I am going to advocate that the, the interests of a foreign government uh, be placed above that of the United States. Then I think you have to take a look at it, particularly if that foreign government is involved in military activities against the United States. Uh, Mr. Nixon, uh, we have a division of the world into two ideological spheres, communistic bloc and free world. As a president, will you try to keep this so-called balance of power or raise the Iron Curtain like recently we had the case of Czechoslovakia? Mr. Krzyzewski, as president, uh, I would do everything that I could to use the economic and diplomatic strength of the United States to attempt to lift that Iron Curtain a bit, to, to give some opportunity for some glimmer of freedom and freedom of choice to exist in those countries behind the Iron Curtain. Now, you notice I used the word economic and diplomatic, and I used it quite deliberately, uh, because uh, we cannot, uh, at this time, with the two nuclear giants facing each other, uh, we cannot suggest that the United States is going to move in with its forces into Czechoslovakia uh, in order to prevent what the Soviet Union did there. But on the other hand, Certainly, as the United States, when an incident like that occurs, or in, or in attempting to prevent, uh, when we get an early warning, such an incident occurring in some other country, certainly the United States, in terms of its trade policy, in terms of its diplomatic policy, in terms of its moral influence in the United Nations and other areas, has got to stand firmly for the right of these people to choose their own way. That's the reason, for example, uh, that I took the position with regard to the non-proliferation treaty that I did. I am against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. I favor the adoption of that treaty. As president, I expect to implement it after it is approved by the Senate. But I do not believe that the Senate of the United States at this time, while, while Soviet troops are in Czechoslovakia, should approve that treaty and in effect say that the United States doesn't care what the Soviet Union did to Czechoslovakia. That's one way that we can use our moral influence with the Soviet uh, to indicate to them that while we do want to have negotiations with them, while we do want to have friendly relations, uh, we must make it very clear that we also have a concern for the 150 million people that live in those Eastern European countries. And I remember, incidentally, perhaps the most emotional experience of all my travels abroad occurred in your, uh, the country uh, of your ancestors, uh, the Polish people. I never forget, after I came back from my so-called kitchen debate with Mr. Khrushchev, we stopped in Warsaw. Uh, on a Sunday afternoon, and 150,000 Polish people came out that day, and they just th threw flowers in the car, uh, they uh, stopped it many times in the heart of the city, and they cried out, Niechia Polska, Niechia the United States, long live the United States, long live Poland. That was 10 years after Poland went behind the Iron Curtain. I say that it's when there are people like that in the world, the United States, while we must not uh, do something that is going to uh, set off a nuclear, con a nuclear confrontation, we must also make it clear that our thoughts are with them and that we're going to use our economic and diplomatic strength to support their desire for freedom of choice whenever they want it. That's what I believe in, and that's the kind of administration I would have. Thank you.
Nixon, you proposed the idea of a volunteer army as a possible alternative to the draft. Now, I believe this suggestion has been rejected by the Defense Department as being too expensive. Also, would not such a conception as a volunteer army preempt the United States from an active involvement in world affairs? Let me explain my concept of a volunteer army. First, it's timing, and second, the type involved. And third, let me say that, I'm not, that, the, that the Department of Defense traditionally opposes uh, any step which would tend uh, to reduce what they think, and this is their job, reduce what they think is their uh, capability to defend the United States. But as I look at the world in the future, the United States is not going to be again involved in what I would call a Korean conventional type war. Uh, if, there, if war comes in the future, I believe it's going to be either a nuclear war, and of course that will be the job of the next president, his major job, to avoid that happening either with the Soviet Union or with Communist China. Or it will be the kind of a war we're in in Vietnam. Now let's look at Vietnam for a moment. Governor Romney has pointed out very eloquently on occasion that when you look at Vietnam today, it is not a conventional kind of a war. It's primarily a war for people rather than territory. And even more important than our fighting forces, what they do actually in the fighting line, are what we do in pacification, in nation building. Now, a traditional draft army is not the best kind of an army to do that job in Vietnam. What you need is a highly trained professional force of armed, of armed forces to do the fighting, and then a highly trained civilian force of, naval, of nation builders uh, to work in the other parts of the country. So what I would do is this. I would not make any step until, take any step until after the war in Vietnam was over. Once it was over, I would move toward the volunteer army. I would get enough people in that army by, of course, raising the pay for those in the volunteer army to competitive rates with uh, what they might get in industry. It would cost money, I agree. It would cost between three to five billion dollars. That's why it can't come until after Vietnam is over. This would be part of the peace dividend. But first, I think we would get a better army, better fitted for today's needs, highly trained professional, ready to move in on the military side. At the same time, on the civilian side, I would have a civilian group, again on a volunteer basis, that could move in for nation building, where it was not a warlike situation or a war situation. And I believe that this kind of a solution would provide a better defense than the United States presently has. Uh, I think further, when we look at the plus side of it, it would remove from over the heads of thousands, I guess perhaps a million or two young Americans, uh, the fact that they can't plan their lives because of the possibilities of the draft hanging over them. So I think that there are, of course, there are things to be said for a, a universal military training, there are things to be said for the present system, but I think the volunteer system is the best system for what the United States will need militarily in the years ahead. It will cost money, but the money will be worth it, in my opinion. Mr. Nixon. Uh, Mr. Nixon, I'm going to ask you a hypothetical question, but I think you're capable of answering it. <laughs> a few days ago, Vice President Urban Humphrey was making a speech in one of our major cities. And he mentioned the question around and demonstrating on the streets, looting. We all recognize that that's all of America now. We didn't want to mention two people's names, and I'm not a supporter of theirs, Ralph Brown and Stoker Carmichael. Is it your belief? Did a Ralph Brown and a Stoker Carmichael is responsible for all the unrest in America tonight? Of course not. No, the, uh, the Ralph Browns and the Stokely Carmichaels are simply the spearheads of, uh, of deep uh, uh, resentments that go far beyond uh, their way out revolutionary attitude. Uh, and when you look at the resentment that is in America, uh, in, uh, for example, in the black community, uh, when you look at the resentment in, in America on the campuses, uh, you, you cannot categorize it in terms of a, a being that this is communist-led, there are some communists in it perhaps, or that it's simply people like the Brack Bounds and the Stokely Carmichaels. It's much deeper than that, no question. What would you suggest as President of the United States to eliminate that? Wouldn't get those jobs and justice, remove all of that unrest? What you have to do is this. 
You see, the, uh, the, the people like the Browns and the Carmichaels, uh, the destructive revolutionaries, they have no plan for America. They're just destroyers. Uh, and incidentally, some of those in the Yippie group are the same way. You ask them what they're for. They're not for anything, they're just against. They're like the Latin American revolutionaries that you see from time to time, and I've seen some in Asia. That's the modern trend, they're just against. What you must do is to withdraw from them uh, their spear carriers. Uh, and the way you withdraw from them their spear carriers uh, is to give their spear carriers another cause, uh, something which is meaningful, something that, where we can be for something. That is why I say that when we talk about law and order, which I am strongly for, because I do not think you can have progress without order, and I do not think you can have freedom without order. But at the same time, you must couple that with justice. You must couple it with justice and progress, because only if you have justice and progress and the hope that an individual can get out of that ghetto where he lives, that he can go up and not just stay where he is, only if he has that hope uh, is he going to be <coughs> less susceptible to the revolutionary arguments of the Rap Browns and the rest. Because let's face it, when you talk about the revolutionaries, they in effect are saying to these young people, they're saying to, uh, to uh, black Americans, they're saying to Mexican Americans, look, you've got nothing to lose. The system is against you. Well, now that isn't true. This is a great country. The system is not against them. What we have to do is to make that system work. And as it works better, these revolutionaries aren't going to have anybody to lead. That's the way to get at it, in my opinion. Mr. Nixon, in, in Michigan, and I suspect elsewhere, public education seems to be in dire straits financially. What would you do as President of the United States to alleviate this situation? You are certainly right, Mr. Arnett, that uh, not only is this true in Michigan, I found on virtually all of these panel shows that I've had in the major states, and I've now been in California and Ohio uh, and in Pennsylvania as well, and Illinois as well as in Michigan, at one time or another, this kind of question comes up. Well, what I would do first is this. I favor the approach that we have suggested in our platform of block grants to the states uh, for education and for other uh, particular activities uh, in which the state has major responsibility. Uh, I also favor, as if and when we get the revenues that uh, are available for that purpose, a, a federal tax sharing with the states so that the states uh, will have more funds uh, with which to handle not only the problem that you mentioned of education, but you've got the problems of pollution, you've got the problems of traffic, you've got many other th problems, as you know, uh, which are uh, involved. And then finally, uh, I have favored, uh, and still do favor, uh, the federal programs for aid to education. Uh, you may recall that the Defense Education Act and it came during the Eisenhower administration, uh, aid to higher education, aid to elementary education. Uh, but I feel very strongly that when the federal government does provide federal aid, as it does at the present time, uh, that we must be extremely careful to see that federal control of what is taught in our schools is avoided. I want the decisions as to what will be taught in the schools to be made by local school boards and not by some bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. Dr. Ferrara. Mr. Nixon, there seems to be a growing communist influence in the riots on campus, in the cities, and at political conventions. Now, if you were be to become president, uh, what specific legislation would you enact to curb this communistic influence or strength in our country? Dr. Ferrara, I've given a great deal of thought to this because I am not uh, uh, an inexpert, really, in this field. I've studied it for 20 years. Uh, I do not see any specific legislation uh, that could currently be adopted that would be helpful to curb this kind of activity, uh, which would not uh, get us into difficulty in the field that uh, Mrs. Claver has mentioned of going over the line and uh, suppressing real dissent. You see, it's the fine line, whether you're talking about ideas or about action. That's what we're really talking about. I do think this, though. There could be enforcement of a law that's on the books, and I should point this out. There's, uh, a law is now on the books, which was passed by this Congress, by the last Congress, uh, which makes it a crime to go across a state line for the purpose of fomenting a riot. And I think the enforcement of that law could be very effective uh, in uh, curtailing this kind of activity. Uh, if, and that law has not been in, used effectively as yet, 
and it may be that the administration may have to move on it. Well, you go ahead. It seems as though the uh, Warren Court has struck down most of the federal and state laws concerning the control of communists. Um, if uh, you become president and uh, uh, Chief Justice Warren retires, uh, would you uh, select a man with similar views? <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, <laughs> I can see that Dr. Ferrara, like most doctors, is a very direct man. But uh, uh, let me say, first of all, that uh, while I have had my disagreements with uh, the Chief Justice on some cases, as a matter of fact, on those five to four decisions like Miranda, I think the four were right and the five were wrong. Uh, but men lawyers can disagree on such things. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm not going to join in the group that says impeach Earl Warren and all that sort of thing, because I think that he uh, has certainly been one who has, uh, has, has uh, interpreted the law the way that he thought it should be interpreted. But my general standard I will lay out for justices, for the appointment of justices, it's, uh, and this is going to surprise you, I think Felix Frankfurter uh, perhaps is, uh, was the man who stated it best. Uh, Felix Frankfurter was a liberal in his economic thinking, as you may remember, during the 30s. And yet, Felix Frankfurter, in his uh, last 10 years in the court, was a strict constructionist. It was his view that the Congress had the right and responsibility to write the laws, and it was the court's responsibility to interpret the laws. And he did not feel that the court should move over into the legislating field. I believe in that kind of appointment. I'm not so concerned about whether a man is a liberal or a conservative. Uh, I am more concerned about his attitude toward the Constitution. And I believe that our courts, uh, I believe very definitely in the division of powers. I think our courts should interpret the law. I do not think they should move over and write the law. The people's representatives that are elected to Congress have that responsibility. That's the kind of thing. This goes back in a, a bit to the federal local idea that sure. you were talking about with Mr. Arnett, except it's not education. Um, you have said that you are in favor of using federal funds to strengthen local police forces. And I wonder if under those circumstances then, the federal government would have some responsibility to see that the local forces have recruit and hire so that they have a fair representation of black officers. And I also wonder if federal funds would then be used for intensive training if it's necessary carry out this fair representation in proportion. Ms. Claver, in my, uh, my paper on this, which came out Sunday, and I'm delighted to see that it was carried here in the papers and that you read it, uh, but in my paper, what I came out for not only was, uh, was for a whole broad federal approach, but you may remember I also said we do not want a federal police force. Uh, I do not want the federal government setting up a police force which will move its tentacles out across the country into local law enforcement problems because uh, the problems differ in uh, different cities, uh, and I believe that, that the closer that responsibility can be to the people, the better. Uh, what I did refer to, however, is the setting up first uh, of, of a national council on law enforcement in which we have the attorney general and the other cabinet officers who have anything to do with law enforcement working on this problem constantly, just as the National Security Council operates on foreign policy problems and as the Board of Economic Advisors operates on economic problems. Second, as far as the training of people are concerned, what I am recommending here, here is a national academy for the training of officers. Now, that national academy for the training of officers would be available to police officials, uh, state and local police officials from all over the country. It would give them the very best training. It, it would, of course, be open. And this, at the federal level, with the constitutional requirements, it would be open to all individuals without regard to race and creed and color. And we would just as we uh, would do in any other federal government activity. And I believe that by raising the level of training through this National Academy, it will have a remarkable effect on raising the level of not only quality of those serving in police forces, but also eventually their pay. What we have to get down to here is this. It's a question of pay, it's a question of training, it's a question of quality. Now when you come to the precise question, should the federal government uh, go in, for example, to the city of Detroit and tell the people, city of Detroit that you don't have enough Negro officers? No, I don't believe the federal government should do that. Uh, I believe that when you get into that, uh, you're then getting into too heavy-handed uh, decision-making by bureaucrats in Washington. 
Uh, I think that what you do is to have your federal uh, uh, academy uh, with an absolutely open uh, admission for those who are, are, are trained there. But I don't want the federal government to try to parcel out into each city uh, to dictate to each city how it's going to be broken down in terms of its police force. In any city or any part of the country, you mean that all the way around? What I believe is this. I believe that what is going to happen is that the very fact that we have this National Academy uh, would without <coughs> question have the effect of not only upgrading the people in our police forces, but of bringing more, representing all segments of the community into it. Because let's, let's face it, why is it that, we, that many cities have put a number of Negro police officers on the force. It isn't just because they're trying to be fair to the Negroes. It's because by putting Negroes on their force, they do a better job of law enforcement. I believe this. And I think that kind of indoctrination from the federal level could have a dramatic effect all over this country, including the South. Mr. Chief. Yes. Mr. Nixon, what, what is your opinion about resignation of Ambassador Paul, especially at this time when General Assembly is in session? <laughs> well, I suppose I'm tempted to, uh, uh, to, to, to make a political comment here, but uh, after all, uh, Ambassador Ball has uh, had a distinguished record in the UN, and he's had a, a distinguished record in the State Department as Under Secretary of State. He, had a distinguished record in the practice of the law. And uh, now that he's uh, decided to be a, a subordinate in a political campaign, I think I'll just leave him alone. I'll leave him to other people. Oh, why, <laughs> then, why do you think? Yeah. Your, uh, your, that, your, point, your point is with regard to the UN. The effect that's the UN. right, yes. Well, that, that, I, I thought that I might get into that. But you see, the moment that I uh, say what others have been saying, that that this was a very difficult time to leave the vacancy at the UN. Uh, it, would, it would put me right in the arena with Mr. Ball. He said some rather, some people told me they were unkind things about me. And so, I read. so and my view is this. Uh, I will let others judge what he did in the UN. I'm not going to judge him. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, uh, after I win the election in November, I hope he has a good law practice in New York. That's where he's going to <laughs> Judge, we'll come we'll start over here again and then hit, hit around. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. I happen to be of the opinion that we need a debate in this country. I think that you and Mr. Humphrey should get at Vietnam and some other questions. Well, I think Mr. Humphrey's having a great time debating himself. <laughs> You're prejudiced, Mr. Nixon. <laughs> if you don't want to debate with the third party candidate whose name shall not be mentioned, why don't you get your friends in the House of Representatives to pass a special law permitting you and Mr. Humphrey to debate? Have you ever looked at the membership on that committee? <laughs> you know, it's always amusing to me when people say, uh, uh, well, now, why don't I get the Republicans to, uh, to do something on a debate or the rest? Uh, let's remember that the Senate is two to one Democratic. Uh, let us also remember that the House is three to two Democratic. Uh, and any time that uh, Hubert Humphrey, with his great influence on his side, uh, wants a debate, I would think that he would be able to get the Democrats to pass it. Uh, I'm, uh, I, think that, uh, I, I think that my power in terms of what I could get the Republican members in the House to do is greatly overestimated. It, you want to understand that are Democrats as well as Republicans apparently don't, are insisting on the three-man debate. Well, don't that's, you think? That's the problem, as you know. It isn't that they're not, they're not opposing the debate, but they say that with Wallace getting 21% of the poll, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned his name because you don't. But nevertheless, <laughs> with Wallace getting 21% of the poll, they're insisting that uh, they can't, in effect, go back to their constituents unless they provide him an equal chance. But if you got your friends and Mr. Humphrey got his friends, surely you'd have enough friends to bring this thing off, wouldn't you? <laughs> I don't think he's got that many friends. back to international politics, Mr. Nixon, you've mentioned, I believe, on a number of occasions, the necessity of Soviet-American friendship and cooperation in solving some of the hotspots of the Cold War. How specifically do you intend to do this? Start with, first of all, reestablishing the strength 
of the United States bargaining position and its credibility. Now, when Governor Scranton gets back from NATO, his trip, his NATO trip, I will make a major statement on NATO. Uh, and uh, here again, you will find that uh, Governor Romney in, in has covered this subject of NATO. I know he feels strongly about it, too. We have to talk to our friends and, and get that strong third force in Europe solidified before we're going to be able to be to have meaningful talks with the Soviet. I think it's been a mistake to talk over the Europeans and around the Europeans to the Soviet. And I think that we can do that. So we start by uh, a program to get Britain into Europe, uh, perhaps a communication and a dialogue with the Gaul. That's required in order to do this first thing. Uh, and then I would begin with that. Second, we've got to be sure that the military position of the United States is adequate uh, so that we are credible and can go in and negotiate, as President Kennedy said in his inaugural, that we must never fear to negotiate, but we must never negotiate from fear. Now, once we have done that, then I believe that while we will find, when we look at it at first glance, uh, that it appears that the Soviet isn't going to want to talk about anything. Because after all, let's look at it. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, the Soviet Union it's, uh, it feels, I, I assume now, that it's hurting us more, it's hurting them. So why should they talk about Vietnam? The Mideast, uh, when they look at the Mideast, they have now what this uh, Russians, uh, czars, long before they ever thought of communism in the Soviet Union, uh, Russian czars had always wanted, they have a naval presence in the Mediterranean, they have influence over the Mediterranean. Why should they want to talk about cooling it in the Mediterranean? Uh, as far as Castro is concerned, well, he costs them money, but look at all the trouble he's causing us in Latin America and so on down the line. But there's another side to this coin. Let's look at the Soviet Union's position that we have in common. Over on the east is communist China. And also, the Soviet Union looked down the nuclear gun barrel at the time of the Cuban confrontation. I believe the Soviet leaders do not want a nuclear war. And that we do have in common. And so I believe that once we have reestablished our strength, that then there should be a very carefully planned series of meetings between the President of the United States and the leader of the Soviet Union. And that series of meetings should deal with all of these problems. You can't settle them all. It isn't going to be settled in one summit, but pick them off one by one but have in mind the fact that all of them are there on the plate. Uh, because I think if the Soviet Union sees the danger uh, of their continuing, for example, in a, to support forces of aggression in the Mideast, if they see the danger involved of a confrontation, they may pull, pull back some. But they're not going to see that danger unless they hear it directly from us, in my opinion. And so I would say on the other areas, too. Uh, I think, in other words, the Soviet Union's interest in avoiding a world war is greater than their interest in expanding communism, uh, great as that is. But we've got to make it very clear to them that if they continue to probe into areas like the Mideast, or if they should move into Western Europe, that the possibilities of world war uh, are very great. I think that, I don't mean in a threatening way, only by sitting across the table with them, uh, I think will this come across. And then I think we can have a meaningful dialogue. <clears throat> Mrs. Mrs. Claver, I think, was up first, and then I'll get to you, Doctor. Actually, this relates to what you were just talking about. Um, am I correct in your earlier answer and from what you've said now that your delay in signing the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty is to use this as a sort of bargaining tool with the Soviets and to show solidarity with Czechoslovakia? My purpose in delaying the signing of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, of course, is that the Soviet Union, uh, at the present time, having just violated not only the treaty it had with Czechoslovakia, uh, but the whole sense of treaties generally, and the UN Charter, uh, which has some language with regard to violating the, uh, the borders of other countries, having done all that, for the United States then to precipitately uh, put its arms around the Soviet Union in signing a nuclear non-proliferation uh, pact I think would be widely misunderstood, not just in Czechoslovakia, but I've gotten reports also, and, and the news reports bear that, but in all of Western Europe. I think, I think that what we've got to make clear to the Soviet is that we will engage in uh, negotiations. We're glad to agree uh, whenever their interests and ours are reciprocal. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we, we, do, we are not going to ignore on their part, a complete breach of a treaty, and then sign one with them. They have to indicate to a certain extent that they believe in treaties, that they will, 
uh, if they have one with us, that they're going to carry it out. That's my attitude toward it, and I think that they will understand that much more effectively. I think uh, former uh, Prime Minister Eden put it very well when he said that we learned in the 30s that when you ignore uh, such gross breaches of international agreements uh, and simply uh, go on as if they hadn't happened, uh, that you pay a very great price for it. Mr. Nixon. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Nixon, today much attention, encouragement, and support are given to the indigent, the defectives, and the rehabilitation of the criminals. Now, middle, middle class people who represent hardworking, responsible, law abiding, productive people appear to be forgotten, and they are bearing the heaviest burdens in supporting this sector. Now, if you became president, what attention, encouragement, and support would you give this middle class? After all, they are being suppressed by inflation and high taxes. Well, first, let me say that uh, there are a lot of forgotten people in the United States today. Uh, and I would suggest that those who are not breaking the law, those who do pay taxes, uh, those who do go to work, those who do support their churches and their schools and uh, who believe in this country, and that includes black Americans, white Americans, the great majority of Americans, I think uh, are entitled to an accounting, uh, an accounting as to why uh, we cannot have uh, the first civil right of all Americans, the right to be free from domestic violence in this country, protected, as to why it is not possible for us, at least if we do work and save money, uh, that when we retire, as Mrs. Hall indicated in her question, when we retire five or 10 years or 15 years later, uh, that money that we saved is going to be worth what it cost us to earn it, uh, rather than having the government break face, faith with this. Uh, all that I can say on that score is that I believe that a president must represent all the people. I believe he's got to make it clear that you don't have to break the law in order to get some detention from the federal government, for example. Uh, I think we have to have, uh, on the part of the, uh, uh, the president, incidentally, I make one thing very clear, I don't believe in this dividing Americans, uh, middle class against poor class and indigent and the rest. I think we've got to think more in terms of the interests of the whole country. Uh, and I think if we do that, we'll have a much better government. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. We have one more thing. It's a short, very short. Mr. Monroe will give you the last question. Uh, Mr. Nixon, you, you mentioned a few minutes ago about letting Ambassador Ball practice law in New York. If you was elected president of the United States, what do you intend to let Senator Thurman practice? <laughs> Well, I, uh, I suppose that uh, when you mentioned Senator Thurman, that uh, uh, I could, of course, uh, suggest that uh, both of our parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, has its northern and southern representatives. Uh, I, uh, I just noticed a picture the other day of uh, Hubert Humphrey with his arm around Mr. Maddox uh, in Georgia. And uh, I suppose that uh, Mr. Maddox's views on civil rights are as different from Hubert Humphrey's as Senator Thurman's are from mine. Let me make one thing very clear. Uh, as Senator Thurman pointed out on Meet the Press about four weeks ago, uh, he completely uh, disagrees with my views on civil rights. I've always supported civil rights legislation, as you know. I will continue to in the future. Uh, he also uh, pointed out that uh, his choice for vice president was Ronald Reagan, and his second choice uh, was Senator Tower. It was not Governor Agnew. Uh, I was the one that made the final choice in the vice presidency. Uh, and uh, I should also say that I believe that in both of our major parties, uh, there should be room for individuals who disagree. Uh, I am glad that I've been able to bring together in our party uh, uh, where we will have dissent, where we'll have disagreement, and I'm going to have to make final decisions. We have, we have Governor Rockefeller, and we have uh, uh, Governor Romney. We've got uh, some of the great uh, leaders in what we call the progressive or liberal wing of the party. Uh, we also have Senator F Tower, Senator Thurman. In the final analysis, however, one man's got to make that decision. And when it comes to, to the basic issues, uh, the President of the United States will make them. What I want to do is to get the input from the whole country. I don't want to divide this country north versus south, black versus white, liberal versus conservative. Let's get everybody in talking, and then we can get, I think, a better representation of what people are really feeling in this country and where we ought to go. To, uh, 
thank all of you on the panel for your very interesting and provocative questions. Mr. Uh, Nixon, we have time for just one short question, if I might ask it. Uh, I was going to ask you one short question. As right an old uh, football coach, uh, occasionally we'd be ahead at halftime, and I'd go in there wondering, how about that complacency factor? All the polls, the consensus, you're ahead. What do you feel about that? Let me make one thing very clear. Uh, I watched your teams. I've seen, uh, I've seen them play in the Orange Bowl. And you always, uh, you were a great third quarter team. Not the first half, but the third quarter. And by the time you got through the third quarter, the fourth quarter didn't matter. I've seen them many times. Now we're just entering the third quarter of this campaign. And I'm going to remember what you did. We're going to roll it up now. And as far as complacency is concerned, uh, people say, well, it's going to be like Dewey in 1948. Uh, and uh, somebody has said that uh, Humphrey's going to come back like Truman did. Well, I, I, I just don't believe it because, uh, matter of fact, I think it's, uh, it just, a lot of things are different. I think it's one thing to give him hell, it's something else to give him Humphrey. <laughs>